What is going on everybody? I have a gem of an interview in store for you today and I would consider this guy a living legend in the field of resistance training. I don't say that lightly. I'm interviewing Mr. America, John Hart. Now, if you guys don't know who he is, I know a lot of you guys do because you watch his channel. I've heard a lot about him. I've certainly watched his videos. But what I mean by that is many of you guys have commented to me and saying, you know, check out John or interview John. And I know a lot of you guys are into high intensity training, which you guys don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about high intensity resistance style training, which has been popularized in the 20th century by Arthur Jones, then passed on to the famous bodybuilder, Mike Menser. Of course, you had the Mr. Olympia, Dorian Yates, who utilized this style of training. But I would say the person that really is closest to that lineage of, let's say, Arthur Jones, specifically Mike Menser, because there's a lot of people on the internet that claim to be training under Mike Menser, very close to him, and I'm not knocking those people at all whatsoever, but I don't think many people have as close a relationship as John does. Because like I said, high intensity training in the kind of vein of Mike Menser's type of style is incredibly popular now. And so I like to kind of look right to the source. I took this interview as pretty much an educational thing for me, just really asking a lot of simple questions. I certainly have my own opinion about it. Uh, but John is well accomplished in this area. He's not just someone who's talking, just picking up theories and was somewhat kind of testing the limits with what he was doing. He actually trained directly under Mike Menser for many, many years. He actually ran the consultations on the official MikeMenser.com website from, I believe it was 20, 2009 to I think 2021 when the site was actually closed down. He trained this style of training exclusively his entire training career and his competitive career. He was the oldest person to win the Mr. America contest and I believe the year was uh, 2013. Uh, actually, when that contest is actually naturally tested, so he was a natural bodybuilder, so I also respect that his whole entire life. Uh, he also won the Natural Mr. Universe, and I believe it was uh, 2001. So a lot of competitive accolades you guys will hear him get into. And if that wasn't enough, he's approaching his 40th year consistently training clients. And not only was he just a personal trainer for that many years, he was actually operating in the mecca of bodybuilding in Gold's Gym and also World Gym uh, in that area from the year of like the late 80s to around 2007. It's honestly hard to give him a proper intro. I definitely encourage you guys to check out his YouTube channel and get learn more about him and his style of training. Check out his books and his website and all his stuff. I'll link it down below in the description box. But just like in the martial arts world, where if you want to study martial arts from like the purest way, you want to find an instructor who trained under you know someone someone else through some sort of lineage, and you can't really get much closer than John Hart. So if you guys are into high intensity training, we talked for a very long time off recording. This is only kind of a snippet of it, but this is really the highlights. I'll put timestamps down below. At the very least, you guys, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, and check out John's channel. Here's the interview. All right, so we're here with John Hart, Mr. America, the oldest Mr. America, which I'd love him to get into that a little bit. I'm going to let John just jump right into his bio, his intro. You guys saw the intro of this video. I think this is going to be an awesome interview, and I got a lot of just genuine questions to ask John. I think this is a luxury. I think you're honestly selling yourself short by – maybe you don't. I don't know. But you're just how much experience you have and what you've already given the industry, especially in the high-intensity crowds. Let's have you just kind of explain your background, your big history, and how you kind of really got into as being one of, I would say, probably the guru of high-intensity training, I would say – uh, in this current time. Wow. Uh, wow. First of all, wow. Thank you, Mike. Um, I want to thank you first for having me on your show, on your channel. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor. I've uh, watched quite a few of your videos and your approach, commendable, and I like it. And a lot of the people who are watching your videos are going to get a lot out of it. And uh, I like especially that you believe in everything that you're doing. So most uh, that's the most right there. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, uh, I've been into high intensity training from the beginning. You know, when I was, oh, I started when I was 17, 18 years old. And I got a hold of Mike Menser's heavy duty training courses back then in 1979, 80, 81. In that era, Mike was very, very big. And he was the high intensity guy. Okay. There really weren't any top names that were training high intensity style training, I should say, other than Casey Viator at the time, right? So Mike Menser, big name, big weeder, bodybuilder in the Olympia, top, took second in the world in the Mr. Olympia in 1979, fifth in 1980, uh, highly intelligent. Uh, some would say a little bit kooky at times, and that's okay. And he had his issues for sure <laughs> after his career. Uh, but 
needless to say, I saw his ads. They made sense to me. I read his articles. They made sense to me. So I, at the time, I didn't have a checking account. I stuffed a bunch of cash in an envelope, dollars and coins, and I mailed it to him. And a man of integrity, he actually sent me the courses. Years later, he would tell me he remembered that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and how old are you then again? Uh, 18. Yeah, I was about 18, around that age. I did research quite a bit prior to starting to train, but I became well-versed in everything heavy-duty or high-intensity prior to ever stepping in the gym. So when I finally did, I dragged my brother, younger brother, in the gym with me, and he and I would go through these workouts. And yeah, everything from force reps, negatives, you know, we did the whole thing and put on you know, 20 pounds of muscle within the first year and a half on both of us. And it was amazing. It was an amazing thing. So I carried that training on all throughout the last 40 years. And I had a little bit of a step away for about three years or so when I first moved to Southern California from New York. But primarily, all I've done, and I mean primarily as in 98% of this time, has been high-intensity training and derivatives of the principles that back heavy duty specifically. So if anybody has the opportunity to read something like High Intensity Training, the Mike Menser Way, that's a good book with fundamental principles that are behind it. And Heavy Duty 2, Mind and Body, those specifically have a lot of material in them. I know I'm jumping ahead in the story, but I'll give it to you. I competed in bodybuilding. I did all of my training with an eye on competitive bodybuilding. I really was enamored with the sport as a sport, as an art form too. And so I did it as a natural bodybuilder, competed, and eventually, you know, winning some smaller shows along the way. Uh, as a full-grown man, I had the most success. I started a family. I took uh, about 10, 11 years off from training, married, three kids, and then the Mr. America, which was always a dream of mine, it was always in here, okay? From the time I was a little kid, and there's a picture I'll share with you uh, of me on the beach at one year old in 1965. I was one. You could do the math on that. And I'm wearing a diaper that says future Mr. America on it. Wow. And so it's a very unique picture, and it's true. And it took uh, about 47 years for that. <laughs> for that to manifest in the physical realm to actually happen. So in 2001, I won the Natural Mr. Universe, the tall class, in, uh, and that's drug tested in Southern California. I won that in Los Angeles in 2001. And then I walked off the stage and I said, hey, that's a, that's a career like that. You know, it was great. And that's as far as I thought I could go. I didn't know the extent to which natural bodybuilding was all over the place at the time. You were working in Gold's Gym in the heyday. I mean, from what, what was that time period? Because my question is going to be in a second. I want to kind of sum up where you were at that time and where you were, because that was a crazy time that you were working. I'm sure that could be an episode in itself, uh, sure. those stories, you know. But uh, how did you avoid just at that time, just jumping into that lifestyle and everything that goes with it? And I, I would think the last thing in my mind, if it was me in your shoes, would be natural bodybuilding. You know, was that right. kind of different in that environment or is it maybe there's maybe I'm just not naive to the fact a lot more people are still doing it or goes what well, made you want to compete in natural versus doing the regular stuff? Well, I saw a lot of the negative. OK, there were some common themes throughout. I was in Gold's Gym, Venice. I was in World's Gym in Venice and then Marina Del Rey. Both of those gyms, I was a member of both from 1986 straight through 2007. Wow. I was a trainer. Yes, I was a trainer in both of those facilities from, let's say, the early 90s, mid 90s, straight through 2007. So for about 12 years or so. So I got to see a lot, you know, and I had a lot of friends there, uh, acquaintances as well. And so I saw quite a few people who are no longer with us, you know, so they pushed the extreme. It wasn't just steroids. It wasn't just growth hormones. You know, it led to other things. You know, they were pretty pretty quick and easy with some of the, the recreational drugs. I wasn't so quick and easy with the recreational drugs. So, therefore, it, it, just drugs in general, okay? Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was, 
I was not a Christian man. I was living, you know, <laughs> in the world, some people would say. And I was doing my own thing, really. And so, you know, during most of the 90s, especially, uh, I really enjoyed my hair, which I know this sounds funny right now, but I have actual hair. I shave my head, but I enjoyed my hair. I noticed that a lot of bodybuilders were bald, okay, <laughs> or losing their hair. And to me, that was mm, kind of weird. And then the second big thing was, uh, again, I was a single man living the way that I was living. I was not a married man. And so uh, I, I dated quite a few few young women. And a lot of them would share some of the stories of their lives with certain bodybuilders. And not everything worked the best it could, let's say. That's probably the best way I can put it. So those two things, the hair and down below, I like them both to be working really well. And so this is going to be that, a candid video. I like it. This is people are going <laughs> to, they already know where this is going. This is great. Okay. Yeah. I mean, look, you guys, I'm transparent about this one. You know, you, you, if we can't speak about the real deal, then go somewhere else. That's what I say. You know, on my channel, I speak pretty plain as well. Right. So, you know, if you watch any yeah. of my videos, uh, now I don't want to do any controversial, you know, way out topics i'm not you know into too much of the politics or anything like that but who, who is this the, is, who's maybe one of the nicest just also positive what was one and of that era can you give me a couple one or two maybe bodybuilders or people we would know that like oh that that was a really nice nice there's a lot of them just someone like pops in your brain i could say a lot of dirty stories or, or it could be a crazy story we'll save that maybe to the end maybe i don't know but uh anyone that pops up during that era you think that was a nice dude nice guy lee priest Really, Lee Priest. that's funny you said it because I was I want to I was thinking Lee Priest only because he's my one of my favorite bodybuilders. I just bought a Lee mm. Priest shirt. People watch my channel or saw it. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just like him for some reason. Yeah, he. Uh, I'm happy you said that. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a great guy. He's a hospitable host, very hospitable. Uh, we've we at the time we hung out with our girlfriends, mutual girlfriends, uh, not mutual, but our girlfriends. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we would hang out and eat together, of course. That was a big thing uh, when his shows would be over. And, uh, it, you know, him, Aaron Baker at the time. Aaron, I've hung out with Aaron quite a bit. He's a preacher at this point. I think he's a Christian preacher. Uh, but Aaron was a top pro bodybuilder in IFBB, one of the Miss USA, I believe it was in 1989 or 1990. And then he went on to be a pro bodybuilder at the Olympia level, just like Lee Priest. And those were the two main big name, Tom Platts, Tom Platts. He was a uh, very, you know, outside of, you, you wouldn't talk to him in the middle of a workout, of course, but walking in the gym or walking out of the gym, uh, you know, a kind man and forthcoming with a lot of information and uh, those are the main ones. I would okay, because yeah. there's a lot of people walk through those doors, so that's that's pretty interesting. Let's. I want I want to wrap up just that time period. Make sure we cover everything. So that you, I think you said the time period you were at Gold's Gym and World, and then you were also a trainer there too. Just to kind of sum up your history, just where you were at that point in time. We miss mm -hmm. anything? Were you, how long were you training there? So I was training people at both places up until 2007. Wow. Okay. And then uh, World Gym closed in Marina del Rey. That was the last, uh, the flagship location of World Gym. There's still some around the world, of course, today. The franchise is owned by uh, Caminetti, Camillary Brothers, Camillary Brothers, I should say. Uh, they're friends of mine, a great family. And then Gold's Gym, of course, uh, I was there until about the same, about 2007. And then I moved out uh, east side of L.A., towards Pasadena area. So I was kind of far away and I just grew my family at that point. And the answer to that is, is I never stopped training. So uh, in 2001, I of course went to the natural universe. I was just walking around Gold's Gym, training, enjoying life, living the way I was living, all of that. And, and a man, Jeff Sneed, who used to be a top NPC competitor, that's Jeff Sneed, S-N-E-E-D, uh, he was now natural at that point, and he was competing in the natural universe later that year. And he saw me in the gym, and he asked me if I was taking anything. And I said, no. And he goes, 
yeah, you should do the natural universe with me like that. We'll go up against each other, the whole thing, you know, like, we'll win our classes. We'll go up against each other for the overall. And uh, which is, by the way, exactly what happened. Wow. Uh, yeah, he won the me- the medium tall class, the medium class. I won the tall class and we both lost to the short class winner, Ron Williams. Ron Williams is one of the oh, most yeah. Yeah, famous I, natural I, bodybuilders. I've had him on the channel. Twice. Yes, yes, yeah. you have with the, with, the, with the chest, the power yeah. pressure, right, yeah. right, right. Another so, awesome guy. So, Another awesome guy. Yeah. So Ron won it in 2001. He won the overall. So I was the heavy, the tall class winner. Uh, Jeff Sneed was the middle or you know medium height class winner, and then Ron Williams was the short class winner. He deserved it. He was amazing. He was amazing. Oh, he's and, yeah, he's, uh, he's got it. Yeah. Yeah, and like I say. You know, I walked off stage and said, ah, that's a career. And so I just went to husband, family mode. You know, I don't want to say nose to the grindstone as much as hyper-focused on on building up for the family, preparing, uh, you know, doing everything I could for my family. And I still trained very hard. I enjoyed training. I've always enjoyed training. I never wanted to stop, okay? Right all the way to the end, I'll be training. I'm injury free even to this day. Uh, training was always there. The diet, I enjoy making my own food. My wife to this day, she doesn't cook my food. I, I still, like a bodybuilder, I still make my own. I chop it all up, I weigh it, I measure, <laughs> I do my own thing, right? Wow. Well, yeah. you know, I got to yeah, keep a little sense. bit of an, a little bit of an image, you know, keep my girlish figure and all that stuff, right? And uh, and then along the way, ten years went by, eleven years went by, and then I saw that. The, uh, the WNBF, the World Natural Bodybuilding Federation, had the Mr. America. They had the rights to the Mr. America title, and it was being held in Secaucus, New Jersey. And they just had the first one of three in a row, three years in a row, 2011, 12, and 13. 2011 just happened, so they were showing the guy who won the Mr. America that year in New York City. And then 2012, uh, I entered it. So I... I took it to God immediately and said, man, Lord, you know, this has always been in my heart. I was getting thrills about this. And I went home and uh, eventually told my wife that uh, this is on my heart to do. And in 2012, I actually went into it the first time and I won the light heavyweight class, but I lost the overall by one stinking vote. But he deserved it. I'm going to say that too. He deserved it. He did. I would have given him first place. And uh, I won the light heavyweights, but lost the overall, and I was devastated. And, you know, they say certain things can really propel you. Certain negatives can really propel you. It depends on how you react to the negative. That's really what life is all about, you know, if you really want to get technical about whether you're a winner or a loser. And in my case, uh, that loss really affected me. And uh, I took about a month to recover from it, get a little bit fat, and then uh, for 11 months, I went on an all-out assault, and every single day, it was on my mind waking up in the morning, and I was bound to push it so far out of the reach of anybody else who was going to enter the show. And then in 2013, I did. I went into it, and I won the whole thing, and I won the overall. And again, I thought, ah, that's a career. But then the WNBF gives me a pro card, and they say, come, enjoy a little bit of a natural pro career. And so I competed in the world championships a couple times, and you know, did as high as sixth place. And they're really good in natural bodybuilding. If, if you all don't know, anybody who's watching this video, you should check out World Bodybuilding. Wait, world, uh, worldbb.com. Yeah, that's it. World Worldbodybuilding.com. Something like that. I'll flash so, on the screen. Just look up the, look up the WNBF, okay? The WNBF is really the legit organization out there. They really do drug testing. And they do the best kind of drug testing that there is. And so I had some fun taking as high as second place in a pro show in Canada. And I placed high in the other ones as well that I did. So I was pretty happy with that. And then, you know, eventually you go, what am I doing this for? You know, this is, you know, that I never told anybody how old I was either, Mike. So I was competing from age 48. And I was not considered small by any means in natural bodybuilding. So from 48, 47, when I went into those Mr. Americas, I was then 48, 49, 50. I competed until I was 52 wow. in natural bodybuilding. And I never went in the master's divisions. I just went into the open and I had decided it was in my heart that should the day ever come where I cannot do or cannot beat my best, that's it. It's over. 
I'm yeah. moving on. And, that, and that's what happened. When, when I got about 53, I realized I, ca- I can't beat me from last year. You know, I was crazy last year. I, I, that guy trained crazy. I wasn't willing to do it again. Right. <laughs> that's all yeah. it was. So I did crazy things in the gym, high intensity, crazy things. Awesome. I love it. Well, I love that backstory. I want to jump right into just the high intensity stuff because this, uh, I don't want to pigeonhole you. And if you don't like that, I, I think you don't mind it because I think, I think there's a lot of honor being that, especially nowadays with high intensity training being as popular as it is. I don't remember it being this popular. Maybe it has been, well, I'm sure it probably has been, but, uh, I, in my past was one of those things that kind of came in of like, I certainly knew what Mike Menser was when I was even in high school and I had the Dorian Yates blood and guts DVD. I sold it. I don't know why I sold it, but back in the day you could get the $50 DVDs mailed in. That's what they were costing. Yeah. Me. And uh, watch. I still didn't quite get it. I, I'd watch his videos. I'm like, I see what he's doing, but it looks like he's doing more than one set. I mean, so, and I didn't really totally understand it. I didn't really grasp it. So I think I tried it, didn't give it a full shake personally. But let's first just say this, because there are so many different high intensity, I'm not going to say self-described gurus, but a lot of high intensity people out there now. And it's very popular. I know people that watch my channel, a lot of people talk about high intensity stuff, even where they're using a total gym or something else at home. People are doing a lot of high intensity stuff at home, which I do want to get to that later. If you feel like high intensity stuff can be done adequately in the home or do you need specialized, you know, quote unquote, Nautilus machines, whatever. Uh, but how would you how would you personally sum up high intensity training in general? And how would you maybe implement it? Or how do you, how do you, how is how your version of, high, I didn't say your version, but heavy duty high intensity training how does it differ possibly from other people's perception of what high intensity is versus like you gotta go super slow or you can't one set it can be forced reps and rest pause sets counts as one set you know so or we have to do a pre-exhaust set before the official set so there's all sorts of nuances how would you sum up high intensity training and how does yours possibly differ from what you're seeing out there right now wow uh it's really a complete loaded question it's really know, a sorry. shotgun full barrel question because yes you you've correctly seen and observed that there are many factions or derivatives of high intensity training uh there is a common theme or thread throughout all of it and that is that there's an extreme effort that's being given at some point in time okay whether you say uh you know you have a dorian yates type routine okay where yes you're right watching that video it looked like he was doing multiple sets now, in his world, let's take the incline presses, for example, incline barbell bench presses. You know, he did warm ups, you know, of you know, two plates, then three plates, and eventually he was up to four plates, right? Well, he didn't give a maximum effort on the two plates or the three plates. He'd do a few reps of each. Of course, to someone who can't incline bench press three plates or two plates, it's like it blows their mind, you know, and this is a massive weight. What do you mean? He's not doing a set. Of course it was a set. Well, not for him, it wasn't. So it's relative. However, and he got to the four plates and he had his, his training partner, Leroy, yelling at him, you know, come on, come on, Dorian, like this. Uh, he went to the point of complete failure where he could not move the weight anymore and Leroy would give him an assist, one, and then go again. And then two, and maybe take a slow negative after that and lower the weight. So he was going beyond concentric or normal concentric failure. And the common theme, whether you're talking about that form of high intensity training, which it is, or the other opposite end of the extreme, I would probably say is like a Mike Menser consolidated routine, which is... uh, you're doing one workout every seven days, and that workout consists of compound movements only, and it's only two or three movements, meaning you're going to do deadlifts, dips, and a standing calf raise, okay? And then the other workout a week later would be squats, uh, pull downs, and uh, shoulder presses, okay? Compound movement. All right. All of them are compound except for the calf raise. So when you're training that way on the consolidated routine, you're going at it to at least positive failure. And then as Mike wrote in his books, you're going beyond that when you can with other techniques being involved. Again, at the time, keep in mind, we're talking about at the time that this was developed. Okay. There were no studies done on 
how efficient all of these techniques were. There were no studies done on which are the most efficient. He was, in essence, discovering them and shotgunning them uh, randomly sometimes, but based on how well his clients would recover and then grow from the training. So when you talk about giving four reps, there's one technique. When you talk about giving static or isometric holds, you know, you can, you can take a bench press and go until you can't get it anymore and then hold it there as long as you can until the muscle ultimately fails. And now it's doing a negative and it comes down on your chest. And then a partner or partners lifts it off your chest and racks it. So that's, that, that's very, kind of my, that's kind of my biggest problem that I have grasping it is just I'll do a Bible quote. You're like the Pontius Pilate. What is truth? My my question is what is failure? Because I guess that's the problem I struggle with is, and even even me, if I'm like, I'm going to go to absolute failure on this one set, not nothing crazy about tempo. I'm just going to go as much as I can. Sometimes if I have a benchmark in my head, last week I did 14 or 15, whatever. Sometimes just knowing that benchmark slows me down. Like I know mentally, I just, my body wants to shut down. Like that's where we're going to stop now. Versus if I didn't know that, I say maybe go more intuitive. Um, but just the idea of, I mean, I could say I could stop I mean, positive concentric, but then give me two seconds. I could probably get a couple, you know, a couple more out of that. Or, you know, or right. I think of someone the, or if I'm running or walking analogy, I can sprint to failure pretty quickly, but I can jog a long time versus right. going back to like super, maybe the weight load, people that are really advocates of, I grab 15, 20 pounds and go like this. And this is more failure, you know? So how do you, how does someone so get failure is? So let's stay in the realm of the gym and the training, okay? And, and or even the garage gym, whichever, okay? But let's stay there because I know that once we start talking about sprinting and running, right, yeah, everybody right, starts, yeah. they all start going off the rails on that. So we're going to say, yeah. we're not making analogies for the moment. So when we talk about the common thread through all is at least concentric, momentary muscular failure yeah. at least notice i didn't even get into all the semantics i didn't even get into all of the minutia of the the derivatives i didn't get into all of the division among the high intensity communities of, of how many sets should you do oh should we do pre-exhaust oh should we do drop sets oh should we i didn't say that the one common theme across the board is at the very least concentric momentary muscular failure and then like like a good drug you want to dose the body at times this is where the skill came in that i saw mike menser had this ability to properly analyze what his clients were doing okay if he gave them two four reps and two negatives he would notice that they in addition to concentric momentary muscular failure so right to an additional forced rep so that they fail on a curl machine it fails and he helps them through okay there's one forced rep and then they come down slowly and then up again there's another forced rep a brutal forced rep right where he's just giving them just enough now they go into a negative very 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 slow on the way down and then he help them up a lot and then very 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 slow to anybody who thinks one set is not enough, they've never done what I just described. There's the truth. If you do a set to concentric failure, mm -hmm. take two forced reps and then two negatives where you, the very, the third one is going to fall down and be very dangerous. Okay. If they've never done that, they don't know what they're talking about okay well that's my so, question because i feel like if i had the bicep curl i could i yeah. get to a point pretty easily to go okay i can't do anymore but if you had a partner and i could do, i could do a bunch of forced partials or negatives i would think for a while but then again would i say okay should i have stopped there this is my overthinking coming in or do i just keep going until i'm totally pummeling and pummeling and pummeling yeah. that'll be a very long set in my mind of where i would get to absolute where i can't do anything that would take me a while i would assume Okay, so the, the truth is, is that there is nobody who's going to keep going and going and going as crazy as you can get with forced reps. Uh, your training partner would get too tired or be unable to lift it at some yeah. point because by the moment, you're losing the ability to lift. If you're, if you're curling a 50-pound a dumbbell and then it, you fail about halfway up, that means – you could still pull 49 pounds, but certainly it weighs 50. So it's going to go down gravity, yeah. right? But one pound of effort to help you 
you can still curl it up. Now we go down into a negative once again. On the very next repetition, you're not going to pull 49 pounds if you did an honest, right. concentric failure. It's impossible. You're now, you've been exhausting fibers left and right. So now we're going with maybe 47 pounds you could pull, maybe 45, maybe only 40. But that training partner is going to be lifting more than he was before. And with each succeeding rep, he's going to be lifting more. Right. You're going to be able, your ability diminishes greatly by each repetition. Now, the thing to be concerned about was what Mike had found out years ago was, is it too much? How far is too far? Right. If you're natural, now, of course, there's the other factor. If you're natural versus enhanced with steroids, growth hormones, et cetera, the natural can't recover as quickly as the enhanced. The enhanced is zip, zip, zip. Protein synthesis at a maximum, boom, boom, boom. They're ready to train again on the same body part much sooner than the natural. So this is a consideration to take, you know. And how about even just the weight? Because I could go, I could start training in this style at relatively, by textbook definitions, high intensity with heavier loads. Or I could just grab, I'm going to do more, you know, higher repetitions, technically low intense. I don't confuse people, <laughs> but let's say 15 to 20 reps with yeah. like 25, basically can I go heavyweight or actually I go lighter weight to, right. and then it gets into the speed factor. Maybe those two variables. Cause I heard that, you know, the body yeah. by science crowd is super slow. Yeah, let, let, let me address that as well. Uh, it's relative number one, but there are limits. Okay. Just like we know power lifters, they're a great example. Okay. If you want to go ahead and work within a powerlifting repetition range for most of your year, you will not gain hypertrophy. Ultimately, Mike, we are talking about hypertrophy. Yeah. We are talking about physique development. Why? You have me as a guest on your show. That's <laughs> been my realm. I'm, I, I, you know, it's not just high intensity training with no purpose. It's right. high intensity training to increase your lean muscle mass. Good point. That's that's the truth. So, relatively speaking, we have all the way on this end of the spectrum powerlifters. They work within a, a three to five repetition range for most of their year, sometimes singles, okay? But three to five with an occasional, sometimes up to eight. Eight is considered cardio in, in powerlifting circles, right. okay? But three to five, okay? Hypertrophy, well-established, is going to end up being somewhere between more like the five or six up to 20-ish. If you are doing normal speed reps, normal. Now we have to consider cadence, okay? If you're doing a normal, uh, you know, a little bit of a drive and a little bit of a uh, momentum on the way up on the concentric, which may be a one second, two second concentric, somewhere between there, one or two seconds, and then down four seconds on average. And that's what Mike Menser used when he trained me because he was trained on that originally in Nautilus was a one or two second positive, and then a three or four second eccentric or negative. If you have the ability on the machine that you're using or the exercise that you're using to take a hard isometric contraction at the top, you take an extra second there. But at most, we're talking about each repetition is going to end up being, oh, six seconds, maybe seven yeah. at most. Because I've, I've saw some, I don't, I don't remember the person's name, but there's another high intensity advocate I heard that was, when this person described their set, it was a crazy, crazy long. I mean, uh, way yeah. beyond what I would even would have guessed what it was. And that was the yeah. one set. I'm like, well, that I'm, I'm just going super, super slow. So you're saying you might have your own opinion on it, but I guess you're, you're basically saying more of that six seconds, moderate thing. And I guess what would you have an opinion on that? Okay. Just the idea of going super oh. slow with lighter I do. Uh, or heavier loads. I do. And it comes within my explanation. I was just within on that spectrum that I just mentioned. Okay. Cause we have limits. Remember we have limits to what will constitute high intensity training. That's going to stimulate hypertrophy. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have power lifters over here and then mm -hmm. all the way at the other end of the spectrum, we have the super slow, extreme, super slow training. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay. And anybody who's watched my channel, anybody who's followed me for any length of time, they know that I call super slow the heroin of all uh, high intensity techniques when it comes to training. Okay. Uh, it, it, it seems to work really well one time. You get super high one time and then you're chasing that dragon for years to come after that because it just ain't never the same. Uh, just like heroin. Okay. A good heroin addict will let you know that. Right. Uh, so 
maybe that was a joke in bad taste, but I'll <laughs> go with it. I still call it the heroin of, of high intensity techniques, but all the way at that extreme, we have the high intensity, uh, uh, super slow advocates. Okay. And somewhere along the way, ready for this? Again, it's been well established. Time under tension ultimately is what matters. Okay. Ultimately, I'm saying it. I'm saying it. At six or seven seconds per repetition. Okay. If you do a set of six to 10 repetitions on most of your upper body muscles. Okay. Let's do the math. Seven times six is 42. Six times six is 36. Let's average that out to 40. At the bottom end of the range, six, re six repetition set should take about 40 seconds. At the top end of the range, 10 repetitions, six or seven seconds of repet uh, a repetition, that comes out to 60 to 70 seconds. One minute to one minute, 10 seconds. Simple math, Mike, 40 seconds, to one minute and one minute, 10 seconds for most of your upper body muscles makes them grow. That's under good tension, okay? Going to the lower body, this sort of a mixed fiber situation going on there where everybody in the grandmother knows you can train your legs with higher repetitions and they're gonna grow. Too low of a repetition, there's a million people out there who train with massive weights on their lower bodies, I, I, I'll, I'll share a picture with you that emphasizes this. I was on stage standing next to uh, four other natural pros and every single one of them, and, and I love these guys, so I'm not you know, cutting them down. Every single one of them could squat 500 pounds as part of their off-season training, not just for repetition either. They were doing it for some good repetitions. Me, never more than 365, four plates max, four, 405, and the size difference in our quads alone is night and day. You know, I had the biggest quads on the stage. So that is, it tells a story right there. You know, I did higher repetitions. I did them with cleaner form. I was not into powerlifting. And so that time under tension seems to be, now I'm not running studies over here. I'm not doing double blind studies. I'm not pulling out studies. I'm giving you the generalities of what I've seen over the last 40 years. This is my 40th year in the game and training people. So I've been around the block. And, uh, and of course, high intensity training has been the major theme throughout all of it. It's not just heavy duty. It is high intensity training. And by the way, I've written three books on it. Uh, like those, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. For, and one of them is for raw beginners. Another one is general everybody. And then I have a third one, which just tracked me for a year and exactly what I did for a year. So you're kind uh, of saying that, practically and through experience, it's just kind of why basically, I guess what I'm hearing you right is six to the the six to 10 12 ish range for six seconds basically is all you functionally need there's no reason to go if you wanted to go lighter i'm assuming you're gonna have to go a lot slower which is gonna be a lot longer set your point is you can get that seems to be the sweet spot for that one set. Oh, yeah. okay yes when we when we run into this realm we already know about power lifters we already right. know that they gain immense power and strength okay some hypertrophy, but mainly power and strength. I, I can give as examples the lighter weight power lifters that have to make weight for weight classes. Year in, year out, they make weight, but they're getting stronger, okay? They look like they couldn't lift 200 pounds off the floor, but I've seen some of these guys who look like nothing pull seven, six, seven, 800 pounds. They're amazing, okay? On this end of the spectrum, so we have, and then we have in between. In this end of the spectrum, the super slow group, um, when you're talking about getting into a set, 10, 12 seconds, oh, no, no, 10 seconds up, 10 seconds down, man, whoa, a 20-second repetition. And you're doing 10 of those or you're doing, let's, let's ease up and just say uh, so average seven seconds in each direction, okay? So I know that uh, super slow goes with their 10 seconds, but we'll go with seven, okay? It's a 14 second repetition, man. You know, you're there all day long. What kind of weight can you lift at 14 seconds, 20 seconds? It's not happening, man. You know, you're using such light weights and that's going to go on. So it becomes an endurance factor. I know that they're going to say, yeah, but the science says, and Jerry Brainham, by the way, was a great guy for the science because he did point out that there have been studies done where you can train to failure in a higher repetition range, you know, 20, 30 repetitions. 
just as long as you train to failure, you will stimulate hypertrophy. Well, this wasn't done with super slow, okay, cadence. <laughs> these were these were higher normal repetitions, normal as in the speed I originally mentioned, six or seven rep, uh, second repetitions. When you double that, you're talking about an average. The shortest set you're doing is one minute, the shortest set. That's for an upper body muscle, okay? That's the shortest one. And you're using relatively lighter weights, okay? I would say, yes, some of those muscles would get stimulated to grow. But then when you get on the other end, especially on a leg workout, that's crazy. You're not going 20 seconds per repetition and doing a two and a half minute set, which every one of them, I'll give you a funny story. Every one of them claims it's pure torture. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is. I had a guy, I was a trainer at Gold's Gym in Venice, okay? You, I'm a trainer. I'm, I'm training one of my clients one day. And I did notice up in the balcony where the bikes overlooked the gym, this guy with really thick rim glasses was, he had his eye on me. Okay. He was studying me while I'm training, whoever I'm training. And, you know, let's just say the atmosphere at Gold's gym was a little different than when a man was checking out another man, you knew something was up. Okay. And I choose to ignore it after a while, but I noticed he was looking at me. The guy eventually approaches me in the gym when I was done with the client, and he comes up to me and he says, you're one of the best trainers here. I said, is that right? You know, because I'm thinking he's about to hit on me, right? <laughs> and I, I go, is that right? He says, yeah. And he goes, you're the only one here having them lift and lower the weight under control. And he goes, but you could do better like this. And I said, oh, okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And he goes, but you could do better. I go, I heard that the first time you said it, right? And he goes, listen, I want to invite you to come work out with me tomorrow morning like this, me and you like this. And I go, oh, all right, sounds good. What are you, what are you talking about here? And then he tells me at the time that he worked for Super Slow in Florida or Louisiana, I don't even know where it was, somewhere in the, in the East Coast in the South, right? I think it was Florida. And I go, okay. And then he starts telling me, let's look, he was kind of thin, you know? He starts telling me how he's going to bury me in this workout. So at first, I was laughing along with him. And then I realized all he wants to do is somehow show me up in this workout as not being able to do these, you know, super slow repetitions for high endurance and keep on going and going and going. Right. And I, I admitted it to him. And I said, well, I've tried your training. I've done it. Not once, not twice, three different times. because." hard-headed the first time it worked so well the next two times like this so and i took plenty of time off in between cycles of training that way but i told him i said you know i'm gonna have to pass because i'm not interested in this not at all and he started insulting my manhood and that's when i went i really am not showing up tomorrow morning to train with you okay you know you're really not getting me to show up at this point so my point in it was it almost became about the performative thing of, right. you know, I'm doing using a technique and a training program that's so much better than anything you could imagine. And it's going to torture you. I didn't care about that. I don't care if I have to lift a weight just one time, but it's going to make that muscle grow. That If I don't care if I have to do a static repetition, sit there for 30 seconds with a heavier weight than normal, and then allow it down once it fails, I can't hold it any longer. And that workout's over on the biceps. I, that's what I care about. As long as it makes it grow, that's all I cared about. And I already had judged super slow at that point as being insufficient. And so this guy, how, you know, how about now progress? Let's get to the next question, which is kind of progressions, because you I guess you can look at the way you're doing it. If I'm going to progress in high intensity, it would simply just be if I'm understanding you correctly. Is it only simply by uh, just, increasing the weight each session or could i go i think i talked to you before we hit record could i experiment and do things like i'm not the, i'm not the i don't really like tracking things i don't mind lifting obviously like having lifting heavy weight but i also feel like sometimes there's a value of maybe going slow i'd like just mixing up i like kind of go off of stimulus which you might maybe comment on that in general basically i'll, I'll do whatever it takes tempo variety more in this case more sets uh but yeah. in using your approach could i is it only weight or you can you mess around with other variables to just progress well, first of all, you have to really enjoy what you're doing. So I, I can't knock you for being intuitive, so to speak, with your training. 
you're enjoying it. It makes you come back for more. You look forward to it next week. Mm -hmm. Then I can't knock it. It's, it's, it's going to be great for you. It's great for you. And then on the other hand, there are certain things in our world that, you know, people just don't like doing someone who's on a diet and you know, someone wants to drop plenty of body fat, but they're not willing to track their foods versus the person who is willing to track the food. Okay. The one who is willing to do it, I can guarantee you, they will get the best, quickest result possible. The one who is not willing to track their food and makes excuses left and right as to why they just don't like doing it because that's their personality. I can say to them, well, that's fine, but don't expect the best result. Okay. So yeah. there's where the line is. Okay. Some right. things you just have to do right. to get the best result. If you're not willing to do it, then don't expect to get the best result. Okay. So when it comes to the training itself, um, yeah, like we spoke before getting on camera, um, hypertrophy and how your physique changes is, is the main goal that we're after. So in a bodybuilding sense, uh, you know, using the mirror or pictures, pictures, you know, once a month or once every quarter, every three months would be the ultimate judge, let's say. Can you see changes in your physique? Now, you have to be lean enough to see it, obviously. But can you see changes? That's number one. That would be the best barometer, the best, excuse me, measuring device of progress. But we want to know a little bit sooner than that. So really, all we do have is, well, you could use a measuring tape to measure some muscles. That's great. On the other hand, yes, workout to workout. The minor strength increases, the minor increases within the, I call it that hypertrophy range, okay, would be the easiest way to track it, workout to workout, to see progress. Now, again, Mike Metzer was an expert at this. I became very good at this too. Dosing some of the high intensity techniques, the more intense you make any workout, the shorter it must be. Okay. Right. Makes has sense. to be. Yeah. And it may take longer to recover from and then overcompensate and be ready for the next workout on that body part specifically. Okay. Well, could you be like a, just someone who's kind of conditioned to just conditioned to high volume workouts? I'm thinking we mentioned Lee Priest and I'll be with other. Yeah. I saw some interview with you where you mentioned Tony Pearson, who I love Tony Pearson too. I believe he was also a big high volume guy. I mean, I think he talks about that and both those guys, I'm sure they train heavy too, but I've heard them say uh, somewhat recent interviews that a lot of them like to do higher volume. It's lighter weight, lighter loads. So let's take the terminology out of the equation. Let's stop with the word intense for the moment. Okay. Because some people get offended if you say, Oh, and I'm not, I'm not saying Lee Priest himself would never get offended. Okay. He doesn't, oh, yeah. he'd laugh this off. You know, if yeah. I said, oh, he doesn't train as intense. Right, right. As yeah. Yeah. someone who does one set to failure. Well, yeah. this is obvious. If I said to Lee, give me all you got in one set, I can guarantee you that one set that he gave me. So I'm only doing relative Lee relative to Lee. Lee Priest relative to Lee Priest. If I said, Lee, give me one set of pick an exercise to complete total utter concentric failure at least where the weight is no longer moving and you work against it for another 10 seconds to be sure. And then it just starts falling down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's take that Lee priest effort for the one set. Now let's go to his 20 sets, normal 20 set workout that he does. He doesn't give that effort on all those 20 sets, but he doesn't use notice. You use the word light. I didn't. I never said that. Yeah. Okay. I said two concentric momentary muscular failure, at least. You can use the same weight. If you want to use the same weight, that's fine. But over here, using the same weight, he probably stops, you know, one rep, two reps, leaving a couple in the tank, you know, and that allows him to do workouts that he believes grow his body more. You know, we fundamentally completely disagreed on training, uh, but that didn't negate our friendship. It didn't negate the, uh, it didn't blow the fact that we could be in the same gym, you know, looking at each other work out. Ah, it's fine. It's mm. not a big deal, but take the terminology out of it. So 
He just, well, I'm saying the word intense. Let's take that one out of it and just say concentric momentary muscular failure is required in a high intensity training program. It is at least that. Right. In, in a higher volume training sense, if you are going to true concentric momentary muscular failure, you could try this mic in your next workout. That is a high volume one that you were planning on doing. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you that your muscles will seize up on you after the second or third set of complete concentric momentary muscular failure, a true one where you can no longer lift the weight. It stops moving and you work against it. Eight, seven, six, five, four. And you're trying to get another inch out of it, but it's going down. <laughs> you're watching. Right. <laughs> You're watching the bicep just stretch out or whatever body part it is, just start to re- let the weight down. So that's really the essential ingredient along the way. All the other techniques to address what you mentioned briefly in the middle of your question, it can get confusing. Do I use rest pause? Do I use you know force stretch? Do I use negatives? Do I use negative accentuated? Do I use isometrics? Man. There are a whole host of high intensity techniques that you could use. Super slow. I count that as one of them. I Mm -hmm. will use super slow as a technique, but not an extended one. Right. Okay. So how can you truly evaluate those things? Well, one of the books that I wrote, um, and I'm not plugging the book as much. No, plug it. it to my mind. Mr. America's Shape Up series. I've tracked myself for 14 months going from slightly fat to uh, as lean as I can get. I wasn't competing during that time. That was during the time period, by the way, of my 11 year hiatus. And I tracked myself, not just getting leaner and growing muscle along that path naturally, but also I documented the workouts that I did. And I showed how I used a cycle of partial repetitions. Okay. I used a cycle of negative only and negative accentuated repetitions as the main focus of the workouts. I used a cycle of pre-exhaust for, and generally the bottom line became the more intense the technique, the shorter that cycle had to be because I'd be burnt after three or four weeks on it. And I'd have to stop doing it, take a few days off and then go back to the next cycle of something else generally. Could I use your, could I take the high intensity approach and let's say without, cause I can see people overthinking again, if they're like me, some people are really good at documenting, keeping log books and that's not me. Sometimes I just like to get in there and not think too much and just kind of get in the zone, my, my music, whatever. Could I theoretically do a high intensity approach? And I've kind of done this, uh, dabbled on this a little bit, but I've been stuck with it probably cause I'm overthinking it. Could I get in there and do a, let's say it's chest. I'm going to do bench press. I don't know what I did in the previous workout. Maybe I did 225 or I did 135 for a lot of reps, whatever. Could I go on there and say, I'm going to put a moderate way. I kind of know what's going to go on, but I'm just going to go to absolute failure. What I can do the next session, not gr- dramatic changes, but can I just go in there, hit a body part, pick an exercise, maybe change up the exercise a little bit and just treat each movement pattern to failure and kind of mix it up a little bit. Could I do that technique or would I have to go stick to the same exercise, incrementally go up, you know, half a pound, whatever, you know, does it matter in that, in that approach? Technically, no, uh, you can go ahead and you can, you know, I, I, I did a, a video called the lazy man's hit workout. Okay. okay. Nice. That's me. And, and I did describe how I had some clients who traveled a lot and they didn't have much time. Uh, you know, they had some high level jobs and they can only get in a quick 20, 30 minutes here or there. Uh, but they could do it daily in some cases, in which case I designed just a simple one body part uh, uh, workout for them per day. Okay. And they would go to the gym, they'd blast away for 10 minutes and then they'd walk on out and then they'd go back to work or go and do the rest of their night. And then the next day they come in and blast away for another 10 minutes. And well, you know, my thing is of- I got all these different toys and it's hard for me to stick to say, just do a bench press. I want to jump on this thing and do my chest, my horizontal chest press. Sure. So just, okay. Okay. Sure. Um, I've, I've had guys and I, they've been on my channel as well who have commented how they designed programs where, you know, this week when they did their chest work, they did bench press. Next week, uh, when it came up in their cycle, they did, you know, pec deck. The week after that, 
they did inclined dumbbells. The week after that, they did cables. So it's completely, what parameters are we setting here? Okay, do you have to stick within a seven day? Oh, think about that one now. This will this blows some people's hair off the head right now. <laughs> you know, does, does everything have to be done within seven days? Right. Well, do you have to do your bench press, incline press, dumbbell fly dips, cables all within that week? Well, why can't you do one week? Yes, for some people, they won't get very good at bench pressing. Sure, they're not training that neural pathway. Sure, I get that. I get that. But as far as stimulating the muscle for hypertrophy and for it to change and for it to grow, and on top of it all, it keeps you coming back for more. That's you, Mike. Mm -hmm. It keeps you. You don't want to keep track. You just want to go in there and have fun. Be free. Have fun. Have fun. Out, okay? That's a great workout to you. Take it to at least concentric momentary muscular failure. If you do that. Yeah, but I want to move on to the, the rest period you need. So let's just say I did that chest. I simulate the chest on Monday. And you're telling me on, on your approach, you said, and that's the hard thing to get over is I really, I feel like after 48 hours or, you know, three days, four days, at least I'd want to go back to that body part again. But you're telling me I could do that Monday chest, not, not do it again until Monday, which is what I used to do when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, the Monday, Monday chest, Tuesday back. Uh, so I got to the whole two times a week thing, but you're saying that really is probably fine. And that's what you kind of more or less kind of stick to is kind of, I guess, what's the rest period between uh, workouts, body parts? Well, I, I know it's fine. Okay. That's yeah. the whole thing is that right. for, for years uh, we went through phases in bodybuilding where uh, through the silver era, the bodybuilders, you know, they mostly trained full body three times per week. And then, um, and they did to positive or near, near positive failure, let's say, but they didn't do, they did multiple sets. They didn't do, you know, force reps, negative static holds by, you know, isometric holds. Um, then we went to the Arnold era, which was, we could just call that flat out the steroid routine, which was six days a week, uh, training each body part twice per week with a high volume and close to positive failure, close to concentric failure, close. Um, as the contest would come closer, they would train pretty much near to positive failure. You know, they'd get more intense about it. And then somewhere around that time of the late eighties um, and then into the nineties, between the efforts of, you know, Mike Menser's stuff was resurging in popularity. And then Dorian Yates came on Dorian Yates once a week for each body part. And he was a dinosaur. He's a walking dinosaur. Dorian Yates was number one. No one stood a chance against him. He had more muscle mass than anybody else. And yes, they all had access to the same drugs. So anybody who says, well, Dorian Yates took a lot of drugs. No, you don't know that. And no, you don't know what everybody else did. If you did, then you would be able to just document it and show us the proof that you don't have it, so don't say it. The bottom line is they all had access to drugs, but he was different. The thing that we know for a fact he did differently was he trained in a high-intensity fashion with one all-out set to at least concentric momentary muscular failure. Multiple sets that you saw him doing in that video that you talked about, right? Blood and guts. Yeah. Yeah. Now go now go back and rewatch it. Yeah, I'm sure it remember. makes sense now. Yeah. Yeah. Now you'll know. You'll hear me saying concentric momentary muscular failure, at least. So so for the take home viewer, the take home viewer would just say based off if they want to try this out, and again, reference the books and everything, but you're saying everything we said about the the rep range and all out failure, and then it's just a matter of do it, hit it on Monday. But what they want a week routine, you would say. And you got the ABA program video, which I'll link that down below. It has an awesome video that kind of summarizes a great uh, just workout routine if you want if you want to know information about that. But you're saying really you can hit the body part once a week? It's been in the last five or eight years that certain studies came out showing that there were more benefits to training a muscle for hypertrophy two or three times per week, okay? And that's what's caused that uh, resurgence of thought to train the body parts more often. Um, you know, I question it entirely. I've done videos on this where the researcher, you know, one of the main researchers, a video of him working out, he should have never let it be shot because he doesn't know what training to failure is. And he called it 
training to failure. Okay? I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So you can put a link for that one down yeah, below oh, for your yeah. viewers. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So that made me question everything. Anybody who watches that, if that doesn't make you question everything about training yeah. a body part three times per week, well, it's it's it throw, threw it all off. Okay. So anyway, I that's how forget, I wrap up. I forgot to say uh, the uh, the question I wanted to ask that came in and out right away is. I love the system. It seems like it's really practical for the common person just to kind of do these things. Why spend more time? You have to, you know, you, maybe you can do more volume. It's an approach, but why waste all extra time? If you don't need to do it. The other thing that would be a big issue for me, other than wanting to do the actual more sets in the gym, because I just like doing it in the actual workout is plenty of stuff I can do with my time. But what do you do on those off days? Cause then I'm thinking like, you know, do, are you recommending people to kind of do some sort of physical movement? I'm saying cardio, but on those, let's say the only guy I've trained three times a week or maybe twice a week. I, mean, I think the most you said was four times a week if you're natural. On those off days, do you recommend doing other physical activity or is it just more like how do you balance that? Just physical activity doing stuff. Ooh. I think it's a stupid uh, We live in this sedentary lifestyle where I feel like I got to do something, you know? I I understand. And let's just say lifestyle related is the answer. Okay. So some people who are in, let's say, semi retirement or they have a very sedentary, work life okay if you're sitting at home you know wfm working from home okay a lot of people have been doing that for the last three years okay since the pandemic right if they're sitting behind a computer all day long then yeah um i believe that they should get out they should walk they should do some form of low intensity activity um on the off days from those three the hypothetical three workouts that you just mentioned right so a low intensity version of it, meaning you don't want to even approach high intensity activity because the muscle tissue needs to repair and recover and grow. And so to allow that to happen, it would be very important. But if you're not sedentary and you have a type of job that involves quite a bit of activity, then uh, I'm, I'm so against doing anything more than those three workouts, uh, unless you're in the fat burning zone for a certain season, which I have clients like that, they're very active jobs, but they have to reduce body fat. So we get them active and we do use some cardio activity to assist that uh, along with a very good diet. Okay, so if you do those things on a very active lifestyle cyclically throughout the year, anybody, again, anybody familiar with my books, you're gonna know, I keep saying it, it's cyclical. You cannot be like a rat on a wheel year round with a high volume of cardiovascular activity and weight training and think it's just going to never end. It's going to always be this way. Well, you know, I, I'm 59 this year and this is the way that it rolls. At some point in time, you're going to wake up and you're going to go, whoa, I didn't recover from last week's stuff. Not, not, I can't train hard. Not, I can't lift big weights. Those can still happen should you remain injury free. The thing that changes, though, and this is to say it doesn't happen is just straight denial. Okay. And this does lead into the HRT, TRT conversation. And that is if you are just running on natural juice, which I am. Uh, but you, you are saying, point, I would just, not to, before I forget, though, you are saying, sorry to interrupt you. But it, if I, let's say I just bought a new fan bike. I love, I love that thing. I want to use it. Can I just sit in that and just pedal slow? I mean, just go like 15, 20 minutes. Are you saying that as as far as cardio? You're just saying something where you're not like sprinting or going out for a long, drawn out, like six, six mile run. You're just saying 10, 15 minutes going out for a walk. I see yeah. you got the elliptical. Something like that is fine as far right. as on those off days. Okay. I just want to give it oh, an Oh, yeah. And, and, and you don't even have to limit to 10, 15 minutes. I mean, you can go ahead and hold your wife's hand and go for an hour walk. Right. right okay. Go yeah. Just low intensity, low heart rate. Okay. Yeah, walk the walk the dog. You know, exercise those dogs. Yeah. I mean, do what you got to do. I mean, I just not... think that's one of the pushbacks I have with hit sometimes, or any really any system is like if it gets. And I know you're not like this, but they get so dogmatic. Like, well, I just did that one set. I cannot touch another weight. And I just think the body is kind of more re resilient, especially if you got a physical laborious job. I, everything is within reason and context. But yeah, the idea of some people think like, okay, I can't do anything. I got to rest. Mike, here. <laughs> Mike, if there's one thing that. You, you absolutely are going to get, you've gotten it. You just said it, is that I'm not dogmatic like that. So it's every one of my answers ends up being, it's relative. It's relative yeah. unto you, the client. It's relative unto 
you, the listener or the viewer watching this video right now, it's, it's relative unto you. So how much can you tolerate? And then, so you're going to dig a hole in your subsystems. Okay. Either this is the best description. And then you have to recover from that hole. And then you have to fill back in a little something extra to set your body its defense mechanisms against a future assault. That's what it's perceiving. Right. Are going to be enhanced so that you're not going to be killed. That's perceiving. So dig a hole, use up some reserves, energy, and break down some things. So you got repair, return the energy, and then build back a little bit extra on top of that. And so for that to happen, it's relative unto you, the individual. You're right, Mike. So, you know, exercising a muscle or, or saying, I did my high intensity set and I'm dogmatic about it. I'm not going to do another thing for that muscle for 21 days from now. Okay. I, I have experienced those guys too. And they, they really, some of them, they look at me like, you know, take us to our leader. You know, I, I, I'm yeah. not that guy, man. <laughs> 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 how do you feel just recovery in general i mean this is something we can edit this out too let me i didn't, I didn't preface this one uh, i always ask this to people that are a little bit older uh and you don't even you look like you're 30 my same age so i don't so but i know you already said your age many times the dates already but what are your thoughts is about as a male and i say this a lot of people probably obsessed with it probably because it's so tempting because it's always stimulated so much to people in so many ages is What's your view on just the way they're promoting the idea of like as a male, you're getting older, you got to be on TRT or you're missing out. If it just seems the thing I always hear is that it's just it's such a good thing. Why aren't you not getting on it? And I'm, every conference I go to is like everyone's on it. and They're telling me you should be on it, too. And you're missing out. Just thoughts okay. in general. OK, let's, let's hold that thought for just one moment. because I had one last thought on yeah. that. Let, let's, know, get to, I, I, <laughs> let's get to the H, let's get to the HRT TRT opinions. What's your thoughts on that? So. Um, there are individuals out there who absolutely need it. It's not an issue uh, of, of desire or not desire to have it, okay? Uh, the number one thing, I've addressed this in oh, a couple of older videos that we're speaking about mainly men here now, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So men, if you're hearing me right now and you know if you're, you're experiencing actual depression and you don't know why, um, you need to get in front of a doctor, get the hormone levels checked, a full hormone panel. If you're deficient, absolutely take what they tell you you need to take. And the bottom line on that one is, is your brother here doesn't want to see you wake up one day, you know, yeah. because. Well, to that point, what? my only thing I hear with that, and I, I agree with you. Uh, the only thing I'd say push back a, mi a minor bit is I've met people and I've had, that's what we all have. We've had down times where it's like, you know, I don't know why. You know, I'm feeling like this. And I think sometimes the industry, if you type in, well, what depression now on Google, my fear is that, well, it's your testosterone. And nowadays they'll tell you exactly what you want to hear. If you go to the doctor or these clinics, it'd be relatively low or kind of low versus the last resort. And so my always thought is like, you know, and I've, I've heard stories of people too, they go on this stuff and like, ah, they felt good, but it's artificial. And then yeah. I hate that people think that it was, again, not medical device, obviously, but uh, that there isn't some other underlying thing that maybe can be addressed and it's not just hormones, you know? And I think that's kind of common sense, but I say that carefully because I feel like everyone I talk to, it's like, I'm not getting my gains or I'm feeling kind of off and it must be my, I'm low, I'm low T and that's what the problem is, you know? And that's yeah. interesting. I, I'm with you on that one. Um, it seems like so. That, so that's one group that I just yeah, mentioned right yeah. there. And then the the vast majority of them, the vast majority, are uh, when they say that they're on HRT or TRT, um, you know, ah, it's just 200 milligrams a week. Ah, it's just 150 <laughs> milligrams a week. Well, you know, back in the in the 80s and the and the early 90s. 150 or 200 milligrams of a DECA was a steroid cycle. I mean, that, that's what these guys grew up. My roommate, I had a roommate for years. That was, you know, his, his injectable, 200 milligrams a week, you know. So uh, you can grow on that quite a bit. And, yeah, you're on steroids at that point. But, listen, if, if it's prescribed and it's keeping you within a certain range, that's one thing. Uh, as I said, under a depression situation that you can actually come out of. Other than that, the HRT, TR, the TRT thing, if you've at one point in your life used and then you did a long-term bout with those drugs and then you came off, well, 
pay the price. Pay the price. Let your hormones go where they got to go and have them bounce back, okay? And you know what? Some of the boys that we knew back in the day, all through the, again, the 90s especially, there was no normal HRT, TRT. You could just walk into a doctor's office and get it. It didn't work that way. So what would they do? Eventually, when they retired or when they were done, they'd go off the drugs, they'd crash hormonally, and they'd wait, or they'd do whatever they could to make the crash a little softer, right? They would use an HCG or some other drug like that to slow it down or to soften the blow. But eventually, they'd have to pay that price. You know, they, there is no climb really high without falling at some point. So they'd have to pay the price and recover. The system would have to recover week by week, month by month. And then eventually they get better and better and better and better if they stay away from it and just believe that they're going to be okay. Uh, the real answer to your question, though, I, I sense what you're, what you're really getting at, and I'm just going to throw this one out there, is, is I think that it's a, a weak, weak-willed, weak uh, thumb-sucking, bedwetting train of thought that the moments that you cross 40, you believe that uh, your gains have stopped and you absolutely need TRT or HRT. Again, thumb sucking, bed wetting. Just, you know, bend over, grab your balls, get in the gym, start training really hard and eat your food. And hey, for God's sakes, I've said this one a million times, get a full night's sleep. I mean, like every night. Not Don't, don't tell me you're going to get that you only need five hours of sleep. My big answer to that one has always been you've trained yourself to sleep five hours a night. And yes, you are under recovering. And yes, your joints are going to hurt. And yes, you're not going to have gains like you ever had before on five hours of sleep. So there you go. Yeah, I think that crowd and also the crowd, I think it just, you know, I mean, it's easy to say to someone like you, but you put in a lot of discipline and you, you look great. But I'm saying it's these people that are, uh, it, that they just never want to age. They're like, I want, I want to look like I'm 20. And the idea of being, I heard someone say this recently, which I don't forget where I heard this, but it's something's a little weird. I think personally, when you see someone who is maybe 60, 70, and they look like they're 20 years old, it just doesn't fit right. So I'm all for the camp of just seeing people naturally. And my point was with you. I mean, you're you're an outlier because you again, you look like you're 20, 30 years old with your physique. People are like, well, I love to have that. So I just wanted to get what this guy's got, but. What they're not ignoring the fact of the years and the consistency and what you put in to get there, uh, versus and just, it just obviously looks different. You know, you look, you know, you look natural versus this idea of just it just kind of looks funky. And people just think, other than like they'll put in the work, but they're like, well, I just it's cool, it's just like another supplement. And I'm like, ah, it's something. And I'm, this is my opinion, it doesn't mean anything. I'm just saying, it's, I think there's something to be said about just aging gracefully. And there's probably a reason why you know stuff goes the way it's supposed to go. I don't know, but well, wh one thing I can tell you is there's, there's nothing more laughable than seeing you know a man in his 60s chasing after 30 year old girls and walking around with that grin on his face like he's 18 still and certainly hormonally because he's on the drug still or maybe he's on it for the first time certainly hormonally he is 18 right. and so on the one hand can you blame him on the other hand dude take a look at yourself i mean no, it's not the way this works. You know, I mean, yeah, you just said it. There's a big factor to aging gracefully or uh, maybe there's just life lessons in it, let's say. And you, you might have to accommodate your lifestyle, adjust things so that you can get the best gains that you can. But eventually, um, you know, hair is going to go gray and eventually, you know, life's going to change. This doesn't mean you have to have poor health. But trying to hold on to your 30-year-old self when you're in your 60s, 70s is kind of foolish because you're missing the fact that you're in your 60s and your 70s. And I thought of this today. It's funny you mentioned this. It did cross my mind today. Earlier, I was shooting a video, and the thought hit my mind where I thought, hmm, I cannot name an 85-plus-year-old that looks really muscular and is still alive on TRT, obviously, on hormone replacement therapy, obviously. I don't know any that are 90 that are still alive. They all seem to have some form of heart failure along the way. And yeah, it's a common theme. I've had friends, and some of you all know, 
some of the shows that I've been on, I was a regular on a couple of shows, you know, a contributor as a guest over the last decade or so. And one of my good friends, man, I loved him. Yeah. Um, he, he was open about it. Rick Drayson. Rick yeah. was, he was quite open about it, about his, his use uh, of hormone, hormone replacement therapy. And I watched him the last year and a half of his life. He was having a heart failure right in front of my eyes. You guys didn't see it, but on the table right next to me, his forearm was the size of a thigh. It was loaded with fluid. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. I, 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 you know, again, he was in his mid seventies and I do know his medical conditions. He shared them all with me. It's not for me to share publicly, but I, I, I know that he was, you know, he was in the middle of heart failure. That's public. And, uh, and it was going on for a long time. And, you know, I, I, I don't know how much of it came from the steroid, you know, the hormone use into his 70s. It, it never stopped from when he was back in his 30s, you know, it never stopped. He went pro wrestler. He did bodybuilding, pro wrestling, and he went all the way up into his 70s. He was still using, but, you know, clinical dosages when he got into his 60s and 70s. I'll say something, too, before we move on from that is, is that some of you out there are going to say, you know, oh, how dare you? You know, besmirch the dead. Okay. It's big talk mm -hmm. from some. I, I didn't be smart. I just spit out facts just now right, about yeah. a friend, a friend of mine who I loved dearly. And I didn't, I don't know if there was a better way of him doing it, but he made his choices. And so I'm saying it again. I don't know anybody in their 90s. I know plenty of people that are in the 90s. I just don't, don't know any of them who are using TRT, HRT. Ready? for 20 or 30 years, which some of these guys think they're going to be doing. And, and to that point about, I think hit training, I think it's something we, you, can't, you can't underscore enough is just the idea of injury. Now, Grant, I, I like doing a, a lot of volume. I like to say, I try to be mindful of wear and tear. I never was someone to like, if I push anything too hard, I was like, I'm not, not worth it. But I think of people that I know that are, and they always say resistance training is good for you. It's good for you. I know a lot of people that didn't do any resistance training, but they were, could took care of their bodies or kind of fairly act. I'm thinking like a nurse type person and they move around and they're pretty good. But I know a lot of bodybuilders don't look so good. I mean, as far as the, <laughs> the joint stuff. And uh, I just wonder like how many of those years of working out when you're mentally and you're thinking like, well, this is going to help me when I get older. I'm going to be nice and strong and fit. And I'm like, there's a, you know, that dose response didn't quite sink in, you know? So I think that's something, a big thing that you're pushing a lot. Yeah. Uh, you're hundred percent correct. As the years have gone by, uh, I, I was as crazy as they came, okay, when it comes to, you know, hanging and banging in the gym and taking chances and things like that. And then as the years went by, I realized, you know, the smartest move I made all along was that it fit my, see our personalities, it fit my personality to do high intensity training. I would rather do anything more intense and get it over with instead of doing this long drawn out thing, you know, and maybe it's gene a genetic thing. My mom is the same way. Okay. Just the shorter duration, more intense. Let's get it over with. Okay. Uh, everything but sex. And then here we go. Right. And then uh, 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 over the years, it became more obvious to me that I wasn't getting the wear and tear on my shoulders, on my hips, on my lower back, on my, and I don't have thick joints. I don't have big bones. So it's not big bones. So well, what is it? You know, uh, well, maybe I am that outlier where my joints are concerned. Maybe I'm that guy. I don't know. And I thank God for it. Okay. But uh, some inadvertent wisdom was probably thrown in there with the training. And I've used it on my clients for years. So I would say I've trained thousands of people at this point in time. And They've all experienced great, not good, but great health uh, because of it and improved joint durability, stability, mobility, uh, giving them the least necessary to make the most progress. That's really been the story. Yeah. Awesome. I don't want to keep you too much longer. We talked a long time, even though I got like another, I got a bunch more bullet points I want to get to. We didn't get to, so maybe we'll do it again. I didn't get to exercises and uh, at home equipment and stuff you like, machines versus free weights. So those are some big areas, maybe for another time. That would be a good sure. video. So 
I appreciate it so much, John, for your time. And I think this was a good closure towards the end of the stuff, the topics we got in, in the end here. So where can people find you? And I'll put everything down below in the description box, but all, all, all the links to your books too. So any information you want to throw out there? Yes. Uh, I am on some of the major social media platforms. So I'm on YouTube, of course. I have a, a nice channel. I've kept it family friendly. Uh, Mr. It's at Mr. America Heart, space between each word, Mr. America Heart, H E A R T, like the blood pump. Okay. That's how you spell it, my last name. And then, um, so find that on YouTube and shoot, go on over there and make some comments on some videos and tell them that Mike sent you. Go <laughs> ahead, hit it, hit me up, watch some videos, watch a lot of videos. And then um, I'm on Instagram at Mr. A Heart. H E R T. Uh, and you all can check out my website. I have a website called Mr. America Heart.com. And I have some product on there you might want to check out. I have my books are available for download on my website. You can download any one of them on my website. They're pretty inexpensive. So usually downloads are. And then you can get some hard copy paperbacks on Amazon of any of my books. They're all on Amazon in paperback form as well. And um, and just so you know, any of the books that I wrote, like I said, the principles, they're not just heavy duty rehash. They're not just Mike Mentzer heavy duty rehash. Uh, at this point, I, I've trained people for four decades and uh, it's my 40th year. And so I wrote all those books in 2014, 2015 and 2021, the three of them. So enjoy them. And uh, give me feedback on them. I appreciate it. And, you know, anytime, Mike, I'll be back. Anytime you need me, let me know. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Thank you. Appreciate you guys.